meditating is a big job. It requires all your attention, a lot of willpower to resist your typical ways of doing things. And it requires you to question a lot of things that you've left unquestioned in your life. When you think about how big it is, it gets intimidating. When you think about the obstacles you're going to have to overcome, sometimes you just give up. That's because you don't break them down. As with any big job, the only way to do it is to break it down into little jobs, manageable bits and pieces. This is where we're focusing on the breath. This is our manageable bit, our manageable piece right now. This breath right here, right now. This moment of mindfulness right here, right now. And whatever comes up in terms of an obstacle is just that little bit of a thought right here, right now. If you start thinking about it in big terms like huge mass of greed, huge mass of desire, huge mass of anger, whatever it is, it'll knock you over. But if you realize you can break it down into little bits and pieces, just this particular thought right here, right now, you realize that that particular thought is not that difficult, not that hard to overcome. It's the same as with dealing with pain. If you think about how much pain you've been through or how much pain you're going to go through on into the future, the present breaks down because it's you've placed the whole weight of the past and the future on the present moment and it breaks through. just can't hold up all that weight. But if you're dealing simply with the pain as it's experienced right here, right now, it's manageable. You can, you can deal with it. You can handle it. So whatever comes up in the meditation, learn to break it down to precisely what it is, the event right here, right now. The word dharma, which is often used to describe what your experience can mean action, it can mean event. And you notice after a while that these big abstractions actually come down to just little movements in your mind. A little bit of distraction, a little bit of greed. a little bit of sleepiness, whatever. It's just a little movement. One way you can see this clearly is when you wake up in the morning and you tell yourself, I just cannot get up. You're too tired to get up. After all that night of sleep, it's still not enough sleep. You want some more sleep, but then you can't get back to sleep, but you don't want to get up. Well, ask yourself precisely what is so heavy in your body that you can't lift it up. And you look around and you realize there's nothing at all. So you get up. That's it. Try to reduce the big issues to precisely what you're experiencing right now, and you find that it's manageable. This process is called appropriate attention. The word in Pali is yoni so manasikara, which means looking at things in an appropriate way, a helpful way. way that enables you to strengthen the skillful qualities in the mind and work through the unskillful ones. And a lot of it is just this question of breaking things down. Look at the Buddha's discussion of suffering and pain. He says this is something we have to comprehend. So he starts with the obvious forms of suffering, birth, aging, illness, and death. Not getting what you want, having to be with things you don't like, being separated from the things you do like. And then he finally concludes and he comes down to the five aggregates of clinging, or the five clinging aggregates. And what are they? There's form, which is how you're experiencing the body right now. Feeling, perception, thought constructs, consciousness. The point of this is if you look at what you've got in these five terms, you realize there's not, not that much there to cling to, not that much there to hold on to. Just a sense of the form of the body, 
feelings, they come and go. If you look very carefully at your feelings, you can hardly s grab onto them at all. In fact, usually what you grab onto is that shape of the hand that's grabbing. As for the thing you're trying to grab onto, it's gone. So you just maintain that stance of grabbing. But look at the feeling itself, that little bit of feeling of pleasure, that little bit of feeling of pain. These things come and go, come and go, come and go very fast. The same with perceptions. The labels you give to things, are, whoop, there they go. There's another label. This is this, that's that. Thought constructs, moments of consciousness, these things come and go very fast when you look at them. And you begin to realize that that not that much there to cling to. And this whole mass of suffering that we tend to carry around comes down to these little tiny things that come and go, come and go, come and go. And so the problem is not with them. They're not all that heavy. It's the clinging that makes them heavy. You hold on to this stance of clinging. You hold on to this hand that's clinging as a habit. And that's what turns these things into suffering. If you don't cling, they don't cause you to suffer. There's nothing in them inherently that makes you have to suffer. This is important because if you think of suffering as this enormous monolithic block that you've got to chip through, if you think of your defilements as these huge monolithic blocks you've got to chip through, you give up. It just seems way too much to handle. But if you look very carefully at them, they're just these tiny moments. The more precisely you get into the present moment, the more you see how quickly they come and go. So this is why we focus on the breath, to bring ourselves as much into the present moment as possible. When you're with the breath, you know you're in the present moment. The more fully you are with the breath, the more fully you are in the present. You don't have to hold anything back. Just allow yourself to fully sense the breath as it's coming in, fully sense the breath as it's going out, wherever you can feel it in the body. And then there's the next breath, and then the next. And always another chance to be as fully immersed as possible. But it's not a totally passive process, because you begin to see that you're doing something with the breath. Even when they tell you, don't do anything with the breath, just experience it as it is in and of itself. What happens is the choices that you make in how you breathe, they go underground. You don't see them, which makes it even harder to understand them. If you're up over and above board about the fact that, yes, you are shaping the breath, so learn to be more aware of how you shape it. This actually opens up parts of the mind that you didn't, wouldn't have seen otherwise. What kind of sensations do you want out of the breath? What would be a really satisfying breath right now? Ask that question and look into it. And this enables you to get more and more immersed in the breath, because it feels better and better to be immersed here. It's not a constant struggle against your old habits of running off to the past and future. You begin to find that the, the present can be made into a pleasant place place where it really feels good to stay totally immersed, totally open to what's coming in, what's going out in terms of the energy in the body. And as you do this, you're developing the two basic things you need throughout the practice, the doing side and the watching side. In terms of the doing side, that it's, it's always striking to see how much the Buddha Emphasis the Buddha places on doing things that lead to happiness, doing things that lead to a sense of well-being. How many times you hear that Buddhism is pessimistic, it focuses on suffering and all the problems of life, and people say, well, it doesn't really appreciate the good things in life. The people who would say that, especially around the turn of the last century, they'd go over to Asia and were always mystified at how happy Buddhists were didn't seem right. Well, it's obviously they didn't understand the true teachings of their teacher, otherwise they'd, they wouldn't be so happy. That was the attitude they had. But if you actually look into the teachings, there's so much on how to be happy. Buddha gives advice on how to 
have a good family life, how to get along with other people, how to manage your money so that you can find happiness in the present moment and also have a few things socked away for the future, how to find happiness in being generous, how to find happiness in following the precepts, how to find happiness through meditating. His first instructions to his son were to watch his actions. And if the actions didn't lead to happiness, okay, you know that you've done something wrong. That introduces, though, the, the second element, which is the watching. The Buddha says it's perfectly fine, it's a good thing to pursue happiness, but you also have to watch what you're doing. Watch how you pursue happiness and see what results you get. Step back a little bit. And take a good, honest look at what you're doing, a good, honest look at the results. And are they satisfactory? If they're not, well, what can you do to make them better? When the Buddha talks about suffering, especially emphasizes that, say, the three characteristics that things are in constant stressful and not self, it's in the watching side that these teachings come and play, come and play their role. In other words, you do something, and the question is, how long-lasting is the happiness you get from this action? If it's not happiness at all, you drop it totally. Don't do that again. If, the last, if there is some happiness, then the question is, well, how solid is this happiness? How reliable is it? Is it something you can really depend on? Does it cause harm to anybody else? If it causes no harm to anyone, you can continue doing it. But you have to realize it's not the ultimate happiness, because if it's something that changes, then there's going to be an element of stress. And when there's an element of stress, is it something you really want to identify with? If not, look deeper. So throughout the practices, the basic motivation is to find true happiness. After all, the Buddha says nirvana is the ultimate happiness. That's what we're working toward. And then we use his teachings on stress and inconstancy and not-self as ways of peeling away our attachments to things that get in the way of nirvana. And it's usually not horrible things that get in the way, it's our satisfaction with lesser forms of happiness. Those are the big obstacles. Now, there's some for forms of happiness and well-being that are actually part of the path. The sense of well-being that comes from being generous, that's part of the path. The sense of well-being that comes from having principles in your actions, knowing that no matter how much people will pay you, you just will not lie, you won't steal, you won't cheat. You have worth inside you. That's a form of happiness and well-being. And then there's a happiness that forms the heart of the Eightfold Path itself, the sense of well-being, rapture, pleasure that comes as the mind begins to settle down in a good, strong, strong states of concentration. These are This is a form of happiness, he says, that you should develop. Work on it. Don't be afraid of being attached here, because the nature of the mind is going to hold on to things, so give it something good to hold on to. And think of letting go of this only when there's when you've let go of other things, the things that are lesser forms of happiness. So remember that as you practice, the Buddha is encouraging you to pursue true happiness. After all, you look at his life. The reason he left home was because he saw that all the things that he was enjoying at that time were going to let him down. And he was determined that he wanted a happiness that wouldn't let him down. His friends and companions all said, that, you're crazy, this is as good as it gets. But he wasn't willing to listen to them. He said, if human life has any meaning, it's got to be more than just this. There has to be the possibility of a true happiness, a reliable happiness that's not dependent on having a young body or having a healthy body. There has to be a happiness that doesn't depend on all these undependable things. 
That's what pulled him out of his house and into the wilderness. And when he found it, that's what brought him back. So think of this practice as the genuine pursuit of true happiness, with an emphasis on the genuine and the true. You've got to be honest about what you're doing. That's the second part, is watching yourself as you pursue happiness. To see, on the one hand, if what you're doing really is in line with your own best interests, and then two, if you've received the results that you find satisfactory. If they're not satisfactory, go back and rethink what you've done. That little question mark. It's, it's in the little question mark that a awakening will come. The little question mark that's willing to question, okay, is this as good as it gets? Could there be something better? Because the question mark implies that you're not totally tied down to what you're doing. You're not totally tied down to the results you're getting. There's part of you that's willing to pull away and look. And it's that part that pulls away and looks. That's what's going to get you to where you really want to go. So as you're working here with the breath, I don't know how many people have asked me, is it okay to change the breath? Well, of course it's okay to change the breath. Who's going to put you in chains? Who's going to throw you in jail if you change your breath? If you don't work at changing your breath, how do you learn? I mean, basic learning psychology says the person who experiments is the person who learns. If you simply do what you're told, you follow the results, you follow the recipe, you follow the instructions. That's one level of learning. But if you're willing to experiment, try something else. See what that does. You learn a lot more. And it's in that quest for making things better, deeper, more satisfying sense of pleasure, deeper, more satisfying, less harmful sense of happiness. That's how you learn. It's interesting that when the Buddha described that process to his son, but looking at your intentions and looking at your actions, the results they give immediately as you do them and as you do them over the long term. He said it's through this process that people purify themselves. That's interesting. The pursuit of happiness, if properly done, is a method of purification. What that means is that our minds become more pure, because not simply through pursuing but also questioning what we're doing, questioning the results. It's that questioning that is the purifying process. But it doesn't have to be a process of self-torture. It's just getting, have, developing a more and more refined sense of what true happiness is, what the potential for happiness is in the human heart. It's probably one of the most radical aspects of the Buddhist teachings. So don't be afraid to enjoy your breathing. Don't be afraid to play with it. There will come a point where, point where the Buddha says you step back. There's a term, atta which means not made of thatness. Sounds really pretty weird, doesn't it? What he's getting at is that a lot of people, when they get in a really good, strong state of concentration, totally identify with what they know, what they've attained. This is them. And yet, if you've been very skillful, as you develop the path, beginning as the Buddha recommends with his son, always step back and look at the results. Even with these strong states of concentration, there comes a point where you have to step back a bit and watch. Realize that you're not made of that state of concentration. It's something that's there, but there's also an awareness that's separate that can watch, question, look. It's that ability to pull back a little bit that enables concentration to become a basis for awakening. So value both sides of the path, the, the quest for happiness and the willingness to step back and look, because it's the combination of the two that makes the path.